This video is going to be a little more casual and freeform than a lot of the videos I create. As of when I'm recording this, Carbide Create Build 400 has just become available as a beta download on Carbide 3D's website. I thought I would take the opportunity to go through the changes listed in their blog post and discuss how this might affect your workflow if you're a Carbide Create user or considering becoming one. On the screen, you can see I have the blog post on the left and Carbide Create Build 400 on the right. It's worth noting that they begin the blog post with a note that Build 401 should be coming out relatively soon. I imagine this is to fix a few small bugs, quirks, or idiosyncrasies that they've discovered in 400 since its release. All right, so starting at the top, we have a change in the file format. It specifically notes that path objects were very awkward. C2D files are actually uh, text files. Uh, that's how a lot of the information is stored. And this is going a little deeper than that in discussing uh, the, the format that that information takes. This is a good example of something that happens in programming sometimes where a decision can be made very early on and the consequences of that are felt in uh, many versions later. But it sometimes takes a rather large undertaking to uh, switch something so fundamental to the program over to something new, uh, even if there are benefits in doing so. Uh, we can take a minute to draw a curve. And I'm going to go ahead and save this file and then open it so we can take a look at what it's doing. Okay, so here we have the actual C2D file opened in a text editor. And we can see that there's actually readable text here. Um, we can infer the behavior of each of these. But the fact that I have to go this deep to even explain what this change is suggests that it's not something the average user is going to need to worry about. Uh, I don't have a version of something appropriate from the old version of Carbide Create, but essentially what they're telling you is that the curve objects are now stored in a manner which it sounds like will make it easier for them to implement some of the industry standard tools that uh, Carbide Create has been lacking for some time. So this is more, uh, this sounds to me like it's more of an investment in future features as well as some of the others in this beta. So the next feature is one that's almost certainly been enabled by the change in the file format, which is the ability to have both smooth and sharp nodes. This is a pretty standard tool that you would find in pretty much any vector drawing program, but of course has been lacking from Carbide Create. Uh, and what it suggests I'm able to do now is to go into the node edit mode, and I can actually see where the base points for my where my curve objects are. And by right clicking on one of these, I can switch it to smooth or let's see. Maybe one of the ones with an actual curve on it. Well, I can't say that I'm immediately seeing anything change. However, jumping ahead a little bit, there is this curve edit mode. Perhaps, ah, okay, now I can see the difference. So that point becomes locked because we switched it to a sharp point. Uh, it simply was, had an inline uh, shape from, from the original shape we drew. Uh, so now there's a quite a few shapes that we can create that we would not be able to have created with, uh, without the use of these sharp, these uh, sharp nodes. Excellent. So the inclusion of these new drawing tools uh, is related to curves is really going to open up what you can draw with Carbide Create without necessarily having to open up an external uh, third party vector graphics program. Uh, as much as I like using those programs as compared to Carbide Create, this, this really does expand its capabilities. Uh, transform commands now support draggable box. Um, there's no uh, there's no image here explicitly to describe what this does. So let's see if we can find that. It's suggesting that you can transform. Uh, it's the transform command. So let's see if we take our shape here and we use uh, let's say resize. Okay, that's much much more intuitive. Um, so you know this is what you would expect to find in Illustrator or Inkscape, and before you had to numerically edit it. 
Uh, let's see if it functions the way you would. So I would expect this vertical node to only scale vertically, which I can. Uh, previously, you could only ever scale uh, symmetrically. Uh, so likewise, this, of course, resizes only along the x-axis. The corner should allow scaling like that. Um, it's worth noting it is not allowing me to change the proportions of it when I use the corner tool. Uh, let's see. The, sometimes I'm trying Alt, Control, uh, Shift. Nope. So there doesn't appear to be a way to override that. Uh, you can only drag proportionally, which isn't that big of a deal. And I guess one other thing to try now that we know it, now that we know the program is capable of scaling non-proportionally, can I scale non-proportionally using these? Mm, it looks like ch yeah, changes to the width are uh, being reflected in the height. So in a lot of vector graphics programs or really any graphics program, you can either scale these numbers uh, in a connected manner where they will scale proportionally or you can disconnect them and scale one or the other. It's nice to see that the program has the capacity to scale this way. One thing I would love to see in a very near build would be for them to enable uh, just a checkbox or something in here to either keep these proportional or to uh, allow them to be edited independently. That way you can visually tweak it or do it in a more, I think what they call engineering focused manner and have the flexibility with either one. I'm so used to the, the shortcuts in Illustrator that I would love if I could hold, for example, Alt on this corner and actually have it scale outwards uh, from the center so that if I wanted to make this bigger overall, uh, but keep it centered on the same point, I could do that. Uh, there's a lot of little improvements, but I'm, I'm really encouraged that they have these basic tools here because once these tools are here, adding more is going to be so much easier and hopefully we can expect some faster turnaround on some of the other features. All right, the next one is text now has a font height parameter. Fonts are infamously difficult to work with programmatically. They're not always created correctly. Things that would look fine on the screen often don't translate well into CNC. If you've ever uh, struggled with a font because it had far too many vectors than it needed, uh, that Again, you would never notice that on the screen, but when you go to carve it, all of a sudden it becomes a bit of an issue. Uh, so they describe here the uh, the problem where uh, the way it was calculating the height of the text was not taking into account the overall height of the font, but only of the exact letters you typed. Um, though there is a caveat here, it says uh, it's a reference height, okay, and that you might still have to tweak it. So let's let's see what happens. And I don't have an old version of Carbide Create to compare, but if I say I want one inch letters, and it sounds like what the problem before was, is that if I then took and I did a text say without a capital letter, and said I still want one inch letters. Okay, so this is what it enables. So nothing here is one inch. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining. In fact, let me switch my grid here to something more reasonable. Uh, let's go to quarter inch spacing. And right, so this is about an inch. The, the capital T is about an inch. And what it sounds like was happening before was uh, something like this would be scaled. And I guess I have the T there. Let's. Let's use text that doesn't have a tall letter at all. All right, so this is probably a better example. Uh, what they're saying used to happen is it would make this new text one inch tall, which would technically be what you are asking it to do. But if you had mixed letters like this, then this would be a different size because for this to be one inch tall, it would have to be larger. Uh, so that's something to be aware of is that they're using Think of it as the height of the tallest letter, or the height of what the font claims is its, its overall height to scale things. Uh, so in this case, even though there's no capital letters, it's kind of the equivalent if it made the text scaled as if there was a capital letter and then gave you this, which enables you to have text that is the exact same size, uh, even though the contents of the letters or the shape of the letters is different. Uh, so I can definitely see that solving quite a few problems. 
Uh, text can be scaled in only one direction. Using the scale command on text now allows you to stretch in just one direction. Uh, so that's interesting because the last feature we had, uh, the scaling was not updated, so you could only scale in one direction. And my guess is if I try to update it here... Oh. Okay. Nope, that didn't do what I expected. That's fine. Uh, all right, so it's suggesting that if I go to the scale tool and I use this, all right, just like the path scaling, uh, it works, it appears to work exactly the same. So I imagine scaling here, right, the corners don't allow me to scale non-proportionally. Uh, however, the top and side uh, tool handles do allow me to scale just in those axes, so that's great. And the center one is going to be great for positioning, especially on a grid. Um, it doesn't look like they snap to, you know, the center point doesn't seem to snap to other elements uh, on the screen, but that's, that's not the biggest problem, especially given the flexibility this adds. All right, increased simulation resolution. Uh, this is probably one of the longest standing problems we've had where small details get culled. Uh, people tend to think that the, especially when they're just starting out, that the preview simulation in Carbide Create will show them exactly what's going to appear, and that's almost never the case. Uh, a simulated rendering, whether you're using Carbide Create that's free or one of the higher tier packages like Aspire, uh, it's always a simulation, and it can be pretty good, but there's always going to be differences uh, because obviously the simulation isn't cutting actual wood in the actual world. Uh, so it sounds like what they're saying is that they've doubled the simulation resolution and they're going to see how that works out because it can lead to trouble such as uh, increased uh, rendering times and such. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that progresses and uh, if people start seeing better detail on, especially on small details. Uh, unsaved file warning when exiting. Okay, that seems pretty straightforward. So if I try to exit this program, I've obviously created this beautiful work of art. And if I try to exit it, I'm warned that my program has not been saved. Or that my design has not been saved. Uh, so that's great. That's a nice. That's a nice touch. It was so easy to accidentally close out of Carbide Create without saving, and that's a thing of the past. Uh, optimizations for large file loading and selecting. So this comes up a lot too, where people have crashes and the program will close, and it's almost always after you've done a ton of work. Uh, one thing that the Carbide Create team has offered to do is if you have a problem with a file, especially one that can be replicated over and over, send them the file and they will take a look at it and try to give you some advice or a workaround or something. But the other side effect is one of the most valuable things you can have as a programmer is a replicatable bug, uh, really for any kind of diagnostics. If you can't replicate it reliably, it's so hard to test it. It's so hard to diagnose and debug, and it's so hard to be certain you've fixed the problem. So if you continue to have problems with a file, whether you're using an older version of Carbide Create or Build 400 or and something newer than that, if you're having trouble, send it to them because it's so valuable as they're trying to improve the program. And it sounds like that's what's happened here is people have sent in some files that they've had trouble with, uh, especially these complex cuts like the Aztec calendars. And they've been able to uh, fix a lot of that, improve performance, and get those bugs down, uh, which is just a nice quality of life upgrade for anyone using the program to not have it crash in your face. All right, next we have the Open Data Directory button in About Window. Uh, this is something I got excited about initially. I thought it was something other than what it is, um, so I'll, I'll explain both what it is and what I was hoping it would be. Uh, what they've added here is a option to click on the build number area and to open data directory. And this gives you a folder on your computer. Uh, it's in your user profile. And within here, there are some settings um, that just kind of save some of your defaults. Um, so for example, here we have the information that shows up in the uh, job setup. So the last material you used and the last machine, um, this is how it retains that information between the program closing and reopening. So if I change, for example, if I change wax to, uh, to hardwood, which is what I use far more often, 
and then I reopen the settings file, it has uh, saved that setting there. Uh, so if you have multiple configurations, this might be a way for like an advanced user to save some defaults and switch between them. It's probably not the most useful thing for most users, however. And what I was hoping this was, is they mention information not being saved in the registry was a way to export your tool library. It even mentions migrating your existing data to a new machine. And frankly, as somebody who uses two computers, uh, my, my, my office computer in my nice warm office, and then I take my files down into my shop to cut them. Uh, one thing I can't easily take with me is my tool library. So what if I need to make an edit on the fly in the shop, I have to make sure I don't lose any of those tool settings when I do that. Uh, maybe this is step one of a larger, larger effort to do that. But my understanding is that the tool library is stored in the windows registry, which makes it uh, impractical to transport it back and forth between computers. Uh, it would be wonderful to see them update the program so that your tool library was stored in a similar file in here. Uh, in this data folder because while it may not occur by default uh, there is a way to use a program like dropbox to, uh, to synchronize these files between the computers so if they ever make that change i'll definitely make a blog post or something about it uh, showing you how you can do that because i think syncing your tool library across computers would be a pretty impactful upgrade for a lot of people a uh, fixed simulation stock size problem uh, this isn't one I ran into personally, but I know at times I've tried to put in very small pieces of stock and it has rendered larger. Uh, so it's possible that it's related to that. Um, there was definitely a lower end to what you could specify. Now the program would run okay, but it wouldn't simulate okay. And that's, you know, that's never ideal. Uh, deleting items now marks document as needing save. I'm actually kind of proud of this one because I think I may have contributed that that bug, or uh, not the bug, but the report. Uh, it probably wasn't the only person, but I do remember mentioning that. So uh, what they're saying here is that if I save this, and uh, so now it has, essentially what happens is when you make a change, the file should be marked as dirty, meaning it needs to be saved again. And so as soon as I did that, the save as and save turned red, and I can save. And what they're telling us is that in previous versions, if I deleted an object, it did not mark this as needing to be saved and now they have fixed that so now deleting an object correctly marks the file as needing to be saved better loading of short open polylines from svg uh, this sounds like a rather edge case scenario uh, it's only apparently for paths that created two or fewer points I'm not even sure if a path containing one point can be considered a path but, you know, sometimes SVGs are not optimized for CNC cutting. Sometimes they're simply graphics files and they don't worry about closing all their paths. Uh, so that could create some issues during import with like orphaned points and, uh, you know, lines that are visually connected, but not actually connected. Um, so it sounds like they were having some issues on some edge cases with that and that's been fixed. Uh, and finally, one that does not affect me, but may affect some of you. Uh, disabled dark mode on OS X. The framework that the that they used to develop this program didn't include support for uh, for dark mode. And it sounds like that was creating an issue if you were trying to use dark mode and running carbide create. Uh, so it looks like they've updated it just enough that they can tell OS X that the program doesn't use dark mode and therefore it shouldn't apply any kind of dark mode settings to it. But with a long term goal of actually updating the framework so that they can properly support uh, dark mode. All right, so that's about what we have for version 400 with a 401 sounding like its release is imminent. It sounds like they've made a number of structural and infrastructure based improvements to the program that will hopefully allow faster development times. I believe it's been quite a few months since we got an update. Uh, so this is great to see them making progress uh, it's great to see some of those like non-proportional stretching and things like that come out and and hopefully now they can start to kind of flesh out the user interface to make the most use of this. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. 
I'd love to hear your thoughts on Carbide Create Build 400. Are you excited by the changes? Disappointed that so little progress has been made? Or just really hoping that that one feature that would really help you will appear in 401? Let me know in the comments below. If you found this video useful, consider giving it a thumbs up or subscribing to my channel for more similar content.